All right, that was a that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, we're really excited to be doing this talk at the Commonwealth Club. It's a it's a beautiful venue, um, and we hope that this is the first of many. We hope we get invited back because uh, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, as she said in the introduction, uh, we have a program here in San Francisco uh, that is called a concierge medicine program, but it's, a, it's essentially a program where uh, each physician in the program has a small number of patients. I myself have a small number of patients, and uh, we sort of make ourselves more available to that smaller number of patients, and uh, we create special programs under the rubric of, the, of this uh, concierge program. Um, this program that I'm going to be talking about tonight, our insomnia program, uh, is one program like that. It's, uh, we have several others, and, uh, and again, as I, as I said, I hope we get invited back so that we can talk about some of the other uh, cool programs that we have um, under this program, under the overall program. So tonight's program is, is called Say Goodnight to Insomnia, uh, High Tech and Mind uh, Body Approaches for Better Sleep. Um, and before we get started, I just have to, you just can just scan this disclaimer. Uh, uh, Sutter wants me to let everybody know that um, I am, for most of you, I am not your doctor. Uh, so I'll be giving advice, and I actually have a few uh, tips that you could even try tonight when you go to uh, bed. So don't tell Sutter that I told you that. But, uh, but, uh, but the point is that, uh, that there, there is going to be some uh, medical information, and you should always check with your own doctor before you... Uh, um, take any advice from someone giving a lecture like me. Uh, so tonight what we're going to review is we're going to start with the science of sleep. So I'm going to uh, make a few comments about what we know about um, how sleep works, how it works in the brain, how it works in the body, and the um, incredible benefits of getting a really good night of sleep. Uh, and they are, there are a lot of them. So I'm going to talk about that when I talk about the science of sleep. Um, then I'm going to talk about a few sleep-related conditions. You could give a whole lecture on, uh, on the conditions that are associated with, uh, with poor sleep. Uh, but um, I'm going to talk just about a few tonight because when we get into our insomnia program, um, th it's important that we exclude certain illnesses before we start full-on treating a patient uh, for insomnia. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the program. I'm going to first start with uh, sleep tracking, uh, which is a huge thing nowadays. There's, there's tons of, of uh, devices that are out there that you can use to track your sleep overnight. Uh, we use one particular device. It's a ring, uh, just to foreshadow the rest of my talk. Uh, and we use that to track sleep. And then uh, we create programs for our patients uh, related to sleep uh, after we start doing the sleep tracking. Um, uh, then I'm going to talk about sleep therapy, and uh, hopefully we'll have time to do it. I'm going to actually try and do a brief relaxation exercise, and everybody who's watching online, you're going to have to, uh, I'm going to trust you that you're going to be doing the relaxation exercise when the rest of us here in the room uh, do it uh, midway through the lecture. Uh, and then um, I'm going to talk about some of the issues with sleeping pills. I get a lot of questions when I do sleep talks. I get a lot of questions about sleeping pills. So we're going to address sleeping pills. Uh, and then I have a few case studies. I'm not sure we'll be able to get to that uh, in, uh, in time. Um, okay, so first, uh, by the numbers, sleep problems are some of the most common things that people come to the doctor complaining of. A lot of that is because it's uncomfortable to not get a good night of sleep. People know that if you don't get a good night of sleep, you don't feel your best. Uh, and sleep disturbance is incredibly common. Um, the goal for our program, and in general, should be to try to get about eight hours of sleep every night. Uh, some of you may know that as we get older, sleep starts to change a little bit, and there's actually a myth that says that older people don't need as much sleep as younger people. That's actually not true. Uh, but there are different things that can disturb our sleep as we start to get older. For example, we have often have to get up to go to the bathroom, you know, more often uh, than we did when we were younger, and, and that disturbs our sleep. And, and so, uh, but in addition to that, there are other changes with the deep sleep, the most restful form of sleep, where that, that stage of sleep goes down uh, each decade as we get older. 
So older people do get less deep sleep, uh, almost uh, uh, without exception, uh, than younger people do. Uh, so more than one-third of uh, U.S. adults uh, sleep uh, an average of less than seven hours. Uh, and so that means that over 50 to 70 million people in the U.S. have an actual sleep disorder. And I would say that the, the uh, periodic complaints about sleep disturbance are actually much higher than 50 to 70 million people. So um, let's start with, uh, in the science of sleep, let's start with the, the mental and emotional uh, benefits that a really good night of sleep can afford you. First off, in terms of, uh, in terms of the deep sleep, so uh, there are three main stages to the sleep. There's actually four, but, but the, the ones that we track, uh, there's three. There's light sleep, there's deep sleep, and there's REM sleep. Uh, and so um, the, the deep sleep is the most restful form of sleep. Uh, and we know now that when you get deep sleep, it's actually doing something really interesting in your brain. There are slow brainwave activities that go from the short-term memory store in the hippocampus to the long-term memory store in the, in the prefrontal cortex. So it's actually etching in those memories that you had that day. So uh, there's, a, there's a book that I love. It's called Why We Sleep by Matt Walker. He's a sleep researcher at, at, uh, at Berkeley. Uh, he's actually still there, and he's, he's kind of a famous guy. He does a lot of uh, lectures online and, and elsewhere. Uh, and, and in his book, he describes the way that, that the, the slow brainwave sleeps and the sleep spindles that are, that are happening w uh, in your brain during deep sleep are actually transferring those memories. And he talks about how uh, um, college students that are doing all-nighters after you know, studying for a test really should not be doing that because your recall and your focus and your concentration is diminished. Uh, so we know that, that deep sleep is really doing all these wonderful things for the memory and for the concentration. We also know that adequate sleep is one of the ways that you can prevent Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then with the REM sleep, uh, the dream sleep where, uh, you know, your, your brain is sort of uh, going, emoting, you know, is kind of dealing with emotions that you had throughout the day and is kind of showing you images and, and pictures uh, that most of the time you forget when you wake up in the morning. We know that the REM sleep is related to emotional health uh, and creativity. So uh, there have been psychometric studies where, where people have looked at the creative process after a really good night of sleep. And it's, it's been shown that, the, that a good night of sleep has a dramatic effect on the creative process and your emotional health. A poor night of sleep disconnects the emotion center in the brain, the amygdala, where anger and fear and other things come from in the brain, from the prefrontal cortex, the thinking part of the brain. Normally, the, the, the prefrontal cortex places a, is like a governor. It's like a check. It makes your emotions kind of fall within a certain range. Uh, when you get a poor night of sleep, the connection between those two parts of the, the brain is less, and you're much more prone to extremes of emotion uh, after a poor night of sleep. So, um, and that leads to uh, a, an, uh, the connection between poor sleep and depression. Uh, so uh, depression, there's a bidirectional bi relationship between uh, sleep and depression. So uh, depressed patients often have sleep disturbance, and poor sleep can lead to a depressed mood and fatigue and you know, some of the other symptoms that are associated with depression. So it's a bidirectional relationship. In our program, we screen for depression, uh, but if a patient has a sleep disturbance, we still put them through the insomnia program while they're going through their, their treatment for, for the depression. Those two uh, treatments are actually complementary to one another, uh, and uh, there's been studies that show that when a patient gets the, the CBTI treatment, the, the main uh, kind of talk therapy treatment for insomnia, it enhances their treatment of depression. Uh, so that's the relationship between sleep and depression. And then, of course, uh, uh, some of the other programs we have are, of course, about your physical health. Uh, and we know that, that poor sleep is associated with many elements of your physical health. In particular, poor sleep is associated with weight gain. There are two hormones that relate to the feeling of hunger and the feeling of satiety, the feeling of f uh, feeling full. And those hormones 
are off kilter when you get a bad night of sleep. And so if you've ever noticed that, that you, you only got a couple of hours sleep because something woke you up or you had to get up to go to the bathroom, you couldn't get back to sleep or something like that, um, you may notice that that next day you actually feel more hungry. There's actually a physiologic reason for why that's the case. Um, it's also the case that, uh, that outside of the, that uh, drive to be more hungry, uh, that, uh, that poor sleep uh, is doing things to the cells to make them more resistant to insulin. Uh, so insulin resistance goes up when people are, are chronically poor sleepers. Um, likewise, uh, and again, independent of the, uh, of the impact on metabolic uh, problems and diabetes, uh, uh, poor sleep is associated with cardiovascular disease and stroke, and there have actually even been studies, and cancer, and there's actually even been studies that show that, that short sleepers have a, a shortened lifespan. Uh, that's been shown in, uh, in meta-analysis and several other large studies. So our program, uh, we start with, as I said, the sleep assessment, and then we do these exclusions, then we do sleep tracking. And then when we initiate therapy, what we're trying to do is, is, uh, is increase the sleep drive the urge that that patient has to sleep. So we're doing behavioral things and making changes in their schedule in order to increase the sleep drive and to uh, decrease arousal. Uh, so I'll talk about that when I talk more about the program, but just uh, keep it in your brain that we're trying to both increase your urge to sleep and decrease the counter-regulatory, the sort of racing thoughts and other things that will uh, make you feel aroused and make you uh, make it difficult to get off to sleep. Uh, we also are trying to improve the sleep quality, and we use the tracking for that, and I'll show that in a second. Uh, and then we try to wean the sleeping pills if we can, uh, and we do that uh, carefully over a period of time. So uh, I mentioned that I was going to be talking about some of the, the related diseases to sleep. And this one is the most important one for people to know about. Um, this is a condition called sleep apnea. It's very common. Uh, and uh, it uh, increases with increasing age. And it also increases with uh, weight gain. Uh, and the reason that weight gain is associated with sleep apnea is because uh, in, the, in the, the back of the throat, and for those of you online, I'm pointing to the, to the, the, the base of the tongue. So the, the nose is in the front of the picture and the tongue is in the back. And you can see that when a person lays down flat in bed, the base of the tongue falls against the, the, uh, the pharynx, the throat. Uh, and uh, what can happen is when that, the base of the tongue falls against the pharynx, and you inspire, you're trying to suck air into your lungs, you're creating negative pressure inside the lungs to pull the air passively down into your lungs. Well, that negative pressure pulls the, the, the pharynx, the back of the throat, and the base of the tongue together, and it usually stutters, and it makes a sound, and that sound is called snoring. So, uh, so when, when patients have that, that, uh, that problem, in the base of the tongue, they most often snore. There are some patients with sleep apnea that don't actually snore, but most do. And what will happen is people will come into my office and will say, well, Dr. Pfeiffer, you know, I, I sleep terribly, uh, and, um, and I snore really loud, and my bed partner has to go sleep in the next room, you know, and, uh, and, and then if the patient for sure has sleep apnea, the bed partner will actually witness one of the apneas. The word apnea means cessation of breathing. So what happens is the base of the tongue blocks the airway, and you inspire, and then you get to a point where the breathing cuts off. So you, and then there's no breathing, uh, no air going in, in or out. That's an apnea. Uh, so when you have apneas like that throughout the night, your oxygen level actually drops. And so we actually grade the severity of the sleep apnea based on how many times per hour you're having the cessation of breathing. And uh, severe sleep apnea, it can, it can stop your breathing up to 20 to 25 times, even more than that in some patients. Uh, and then we also grade it based on how low the oxygen level drops when you're having those apne apneas throughout the, the night. 
We also look at some other uh, uh, related conditions when we are uh, doing the initial screening before we put a patient into the sleep therapy, the insomnia program. Um, anxiety is one of them. Uh, just like with depression, we don't uh, not initiate therapy. We do initiate therapy if a patient has anxiety and sleep disturbance. Those two things uh, are very commonly associated with one another. And there's a particular kind of anxiety called sleep anxiety, which I'll talk about in a second, that, uh, that becomes the, the focus for the, the uh, behavioral treatment uh, for, for sleeping. Um, also, uh, uh, additional considerations are a post-traumatic stress disorder. That's when there's been an emotional or physical or uh, uh, mental trauma in the past, in that patient's past, and the patient has uh, recurring thoughts, usually intrusive thoughts about that trauma, uh, and that leads to uh, a form of anxiety related to the, to the past trauma. It is very, very common to have sleep disturbance when someone has PTSD, po post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, that one uh, often requires that we collaborate with a psychiatrist. We actually have a psychologist in our building that works for the Institute for Health and Healing, which is kind of a partner program uh, to our concierge medicine program. And she works with our patients that have had uh, previous trauma. Uh, she also works with insomnia as well. Um, so uh, then what we do is we look for, uh, for other illnesses, of course, uh, uh, brain injury, uh, Alzheimer's disease. There are other things that, that are associated with sleep disturbance that, that require kind of co-treatment. Uh, when we're going into this program. And then we look at the medicine. So, of course, we, uh, there's a lot of use of stimulants nowadays, uh, bronchodilators, the uh, inhalers that you use for asthma can uh, create stimulation and disturb your sleep as well. So we look at all of those things, and then there's a, a, a pretty common illness called restless leg syndrome, which I don't have time to talk about today, but, but it's another thing that we look for when we're assessing sleep disturbance. Um, so our next uh, thing that we do is we, we look at uh, sleep tracking. So we use uh, these rings th that I'm wearing to do sleep tracking overnight. The ring has an accelerometer in it, so it measures movement. It also measures heart rate. Uh, the newer versions of these rings can also even measure your uh, oxygen saturation level. This is an old one, so it doesn't do that, but, but, uh, but the newest version of, of the rings can actually measure the oxygen saturation level uh, overnight. Uh, so um, they're really remarkable pieces of technology, uh, and so many people are wearing them nowadays that, um, that uh, we're, we're really getting lots of feedback from our patients coming to us even you know, before we've told them about it and given them the ring like we do in our practice. Uh, so, uh, and of course, there's lots of ways to do sleep tracking nowadays. There are pads that you can put on your bed uh, that kind of connect, you know, to a plug next to the bed and it will actually measure your movement overnight and model out your sleep by stages uh, and give you a pretty good readout. Um, I think the sleep number beds uh, that they sell in uh, mattress stores and bed stores uh, they can do sleep tracking uh, nowadays as well. And I think the sleep number bed even adjusts itself if it thinks that you need to be adjusted to reduce uh, apneas and other things uh, as well. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, regular mobile apps that will sort of listen to your breathing overnight just passively. Uh, there's, of course, meditation apps and other things. So the technology has really, uh, is really uh, come to bear in a, in, a, in a great way, and I think people are feeling more empowered to, to get a better night of sleep because of the technology, and that's been really good for us. So this is a, a screenshot that shows the, uh, the, the tool that we use. This is the mobile app from the phone. That's a night of sleep that I actually had. Uh, and, uh, and what it shows is it, up at the top is that that night, I got five hours and 55 minutes of sleep. Uh, so that is not my best night of sleep. I, I probably... Uh, should have slept a little bit more, uh, but uh, for reasons that we'll talk about in this program, uh, something woke me up uh, from sleep, and uh, I didn't get the best night of sleep in the world. But the, 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 uh, it's not all bad, uh, because it's five hours and 55 minutes of sleep, but if you look at the blue bars down at the bottom, and uh, online I'm not sure you can see my little pointer here, but but if you look at the, the, the middle of the screen there, it shows light sleep in the, in the uh, medium blue. The lightest blue uh, shows the REM sleep. And then the deep sleep is all the bars down at the bottom. 
so that night I got lots of deep sleep. So I could have been recovering from something. I could have got a bad night of sleep the night before. And I'll show you another example of, of something like that. So just because I got five hours and 55 minutes of sleep doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't high quality sleep and I didn't feel good the next morning. Because I, I, as I recall, after that night of sleep, I did feel actually pretty good. So this is my slide to show you uh, what I mean by that. Um, in this slide, what I'm showing is two examples of my, my night of sleep. On the slide, on, on the, the picture on the left, uh, it shows that I got eight hours and 39 minutes of sleep. And I will tell you that that night I took uh, the medicine NyQuil, the, the, uh, sleep, the, the uh, cold medicine that you take if you're, if you're congested and you want to get a night of sleep. And I never take NyQuil. I, I did it that one night because I was really annoyed by the, uh, the cold that I had and I wanted to get a good night of sleep and I knew that that would work. Um, and of course, I did sleep a lot, but I did not sleep well. So that next morning, when I woke up after having that NyQuil-induced night of sleep, um, I felt terrible, uh, even though I had gotten eight hours and 39 minutes of sleep. And if you look at those blue bars that I told you about before, uh, down at the bottom there, there's very few of them. I got 20 minutes only of deep sleep on the night that I took the NyQuil. So it disturbed my deep sleep and knocked it out totally. So the next night, I didn't take the NyQuil, uh, because I didn't want that to happen again. And I only got four hours and 11 minutes of sleep. And the reason I only got four hours and 11 minutes of sleep is because I slept for so long the night before. We're going to talk about sleep drive in a second. But my sleep drive was all knocked out. So I went to bed after midnight, which I'm pretty good about not doing. I'm pretty good about going to bed at 1030. I'm regular. Uh, and, but that night, because I had slept so much the night before, I went to bed at midnight. My body still woke me up at my regular wake-up time, which is usually 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, and I only got 4 hours and 11 minutes of sleep that night. But I felt great. And the reason I felt great after that short period of sleep is because I got tons of deep sleep. So my body was rebounding. My body was recovering from that bad night that I had had with all that extra bad sleep the night before, it was recovering. And I, and I, got a, I had a recovery night, and I got a lot of uh, deep sleep. So I've mentioned the, the term sleep drive a few times, and I've mentioned uh, a few other things about, uh, about sleep. And I want to show you, uh, spend a few minutes on this slide, because this is a really important concept that I hope everybody understands uh, after the lecture tonight. There are two processes at play in your body uh, every night. One is building up your urge to sleep, your sleep drive. That is mediated by a neurotransmitter, adenosine, and it's going up and up and up throughout the day as you are awake and active. When you fall asleep, that adenosine gets washed out. The process of sleep reduces the, the neurotransmitter in the brain, but you have to be asleep for that to happen. So the adenosine builds up, 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 you get to a certain point, and then the adenosine causes the uh, drops. Uh, and you know, for the people online, I'm, I'm pointing to the, the kind of waves. Uh, that's the, the called process C, the urge to sleep. There's a second process that is independent of that process that's, uh, that's going in your body every day. You have a, an internal clock, a body clock, a circadian rhythm. It's mediated by a, a center in the brain. And that circadian rhythm is going to go in waves up and down, up and down every night on a 24-hour cycle. The circadian rhythm medi mediates your wakefulness uh, signal. So what's happening is during the day, the wakefulness signal is going up and staying elevated, and it's paralleling the sleep signal. That's why you don't feel like you, sh you need to go to sleep, because the wakefulness signal is opposing it, is opposing that sleep signal. Uh, and then uh, um, when, when your body feels like it's time for you to go to sleep, the wakefulness signal drops, but the sleep signal is still very high. And that's the moment where you feel like, I, gotta go to, I, gotta, my eyes, I can't keep my eyes open. I got to go to sleep. So that is your perfect bedtime uh, because then when you fall asleep, the, the circadian rhythm, the wakefulness signal is dropping. And the, the sleep signal is dropping, but you're asleep. So then in the morning, right before you start to wake up, 
the circadian rhythm comes back around, the wakefulness signal comes back up, and it approaches the, the line for the sleep signal. When those two lines come together, you wake up, and you feel like now is the time to, to be awake. So you see there's a very regulated process here, um, and there are two things that can interfere with that process. One is if you, it, you do something to interfere with your sleep drive, that adenosine that's building up throughout the day. One way to do that is you could take a nap. If, if you take a nap in the afternoon, you have decreased your sleep drive, and by the time it's, it's time for you to go to bed that night, you won't feel sleepy. So that's one thing, one way that you can uh, make it difficult for you to, to get off to sleep at night. Another way is that you can increase the arousal signal at the time that your body clock is saying, okay, it's time for arousal to go down because it's time for, for uh, this guy to go to sleep. So uh, there are several ways you can increase your arousal signal. The main way is uh, racing thoughts. That's what happens to people most of the time uh, when they're trying to get off to sleep at night. So, so uh, a thing to remember is that sleep is one of those things that, uh, one of the few things actually, that the harder that you try to do it, the worse you're going to be at it. It should be a natural process. It's a passive process that's supposed to happen with the body clock every night. Uh, but what happens with the arousal signal is that you get a thought that happens throughout the day. Sometimes that thought is, boy, I better get to sleep right now because if I don't get to sleep right now, I'm going to be terrible tomorrow. Uh, my boss is going to be mad at me. I got that big presentation that's coming up tomorrow. I better get off to sleep. So you, that thought goes through your head and then you engage with that thought. It makes you frustrated. It makes you anxious. And then what happens is you get a body response. So your neck tenses up, your shoulders tense up, and then that intensifies the thought or feeling and you have more thoughts like that because you're having this body response and then it goes round and round and round. So that's what happens when you are ruminating and that creates arousal. Um, so as I said, there are two things that, that we are trying to do when we initiate therapy for insomnia. We are trying to increase the sleep drive and we're trying to decrease arousals. And there's a particular kind of arousal called conditioned arousal where uh, you have actually associated your bed or the bedroom environment with anxiety about sleep. These are people who feel very anxious about going to sleep. And what happens is that you connect the bed in your mind with being awake. So you, and you're, when you make that connection in your mind, the minute that you get into bed, you start to tense up and you start to feel like, you know, this is not a good place for somebody to go to sleep because I remember last night I tried to sleep here and I laid awake for three hours and I couldn't get to sleep. So I'm pretty sure that's what's going to happen again. And that's what creates the, uh, the anxiety. So uh, the, the, uh, the ways to increase your sleep drive are uh, don't take naps, arise at the same time every morning, and then related to both conditioned arousal and sleep drive, go to bed when you're sleepy and not before. Uh, and then the second thing uh, that, we, that we talk about with the conditioned arousal is uh, to get out of bed uh, when you are not sleepy. So sometimes th th you know, we have to work with people on that because sometimes people wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and they're like, Dr. Piper, are you really? I'm really going to get out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning? You know, I'm going to disturb my husband or wife. I'm, uh, I'm going to get out of bed and that's really what you want me to do? There, there is some room for some attempts to uh, calm your mind and, and relax yourself and get back off to sleep if it's actually 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but, but if that's not working, the, the teaching is to get out of bed and not continue to associate that bed environment with the poor sleep. The other thing that we do when we are uh, working uh, with an insomnia with, uh, situation is we do something called sleep restriction therapy, which is a little bit of a misnomer. It's actually uh, time in bed restriction. So what we're doing is we're restricting the amount of time in bed to the amount of time that that patient is asleep plus about half an hour. So that means if, if we're doing your sleep tracking and you're averaging six hours a night, you're only allowed to be in bed six and a half hours when we start this therapy. And there might be a few days 
when you have a bad day because you, you know, Dr. Pfeiffer said, get out of bed at six o'clock in the morning, even though, you know, I feel like I want to go back to sleep and get another nap. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to really build that sleep drive for the next night. And then we slowly increase the window in bed to get to the point where you're getting that full seven, seven and a half hours and it's high quality sleep. So that's what we try to do. Um, sleep restriction therapy is very effective. I won't dwell on that slide, but it works. Um, okay. And then the last thing, of course, that we do is there is uh, the, the environment of, uh, of your bedroom uh, needs to be uh, a perfect place to sleep. So it needs to be dark. It needs to be cool. Uh, and uh, 65 degrees is thought to be sort of the ideal uh, temperature for the, uh, for the bedroom. Um, you need to limit screen time uh, before you go to bed. No iPad, uh, certainly no doom scrolling or anything like that because that will make a arousal <laughs> as well. And then uh, um, you should try and get some exercise every day. And I tell my patients to just avoid alcohol and caffeine uh, altogether. Sometimes that's more difficult uh, for some people to do than others. Um, but what I usually try to get people to do is, is do an experiment uh, for a week or two weeks where there's no alcohol or caffeine uh, after I convince them that the alcohol is not really helping them get off to sleep. Um, so, and that is, that is true even of small amounts of alcohol. So uh, I just, you know, it's, it's important that I say this because I cannot tell you how common it is for people to keep a little uh, liqueur or something like that at the bedside as a sleep aid or to take it right before you get into bed uh, or a glass of wine or something like that. Um, that is disturbing your sleep and, and uh, it might actually uh, improve sleep latency. You might get to sleep a little bit faster, uh, but you will have more restless sleep and the sleep quality will be dramatically less even after a single glass of wine. All right. So uh, now we're going to do a, a relaxation exercise. And this is something that, you, despite my disclaimer in the beginning, this is something you can actually try tonight uh, if you want to. So what I want everybody to do is get comfortable in your chair in the room here. And if you're at home watching on, on video, get comfortable in your chair there. Uh, and I want you to release your shoulders. I want you to gently close your eyes. And I want you to begin to focus your, your mind on your breath. So we're going to do a couple of uh, breaths of what's called box breathing, where we uh, breathe in slowly, we hold it for three seconds, we breathe out slowly, and then we hold the exhale for three seconds. Okay? So we're going to do that two times. Or just everyone just sort of relax yourself for a minute. And I want you to slowly take a deep breath in. Two, three, hold. Two, three, exhale. Two, three, hold. Two, three, inhale. Hold, two, three, <coughs> exhale, two, three, hold, two, three. Now with your eyes closed, start breathing normally. Keep your mind focused on your breath. Breath comes in and goes out just naturally. And I want you to scan in your mind from the top of your head down to your neck and into your shoulders and I want you to mentally probe for any tension that's there. Are you carrying tension in your neck and in your shoulders? And I want you to gently release that tension. Let your shoulders drop down slowly, and then come back to your breath. Okay, good. Open your eyes. 
So that relaxation technique and the body scan technique, you can do on all of the, the body muscles. By the way, there's also some really good uh, apps like Headspace uh, where you can do guided meditations and they will take you through the body scan meditation. They'll take you through uh, guided imagery meditations. They're really great. Uh, and um, they even sell uh, comfortable headphones that you can use um, uh, to wear uh, right as you're going to sleep. You could sleep with them on. Um, so it's, uh, it's a really nice uh, adjunct to, uh, to getting off to sleep or getting back to sleep if you wake up at night. The other part of this uh, CBTI therapy, the cognitive behavioral therapy, I just told you the, the behavioral part. It's the sleep restriction, the stimulus control, go to bed when you're sleepy, no naps. That is part of the CBTI. That's the B part. The C part is cognitive therapy. And so, and so under the C part, um, what we're trying to do is identify these things called cognitive distortions and then we're trying to unwire them or rewire them. So a cognitive distortion could be something like catastrophizing. I can't see that. Five minutes, okay. We're okay? Okay. Okay, great. So, um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to unwire those thoughts. We're trying to, to uh, diminish those thoughts. And this is something that's done with a therapist. Uh, and our therapist does... Uh, uh, Imki Dokina, the, the, psychi the psychologist, excuse me, that works in our program, uh, uses this kind of therapy. So it, you use Socratic method to try to sort of challenge the, the, uh, the negative thoughts that are interfering with, with sleep. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much more of that because that's something for the psychologist to deal with. Um, okay, I always talk uh, just briefly about medicines. And here's the the uh, one-liner on medicines. Um, all of the sleep medicines are, that are available on the market are only approved for up to about three months. They're all short-term. So, uh, so, and some of them work better at certain things than others. I'm actually somewhat partial to the, the oldest medicine, doxepin, which is a tricyclic antidepressant um, and, uh, and has the least uh, sleep disturbance uh, in, in the literature. Um, uh, if you were to ask me which is the most effective medicine at getting off to sleep, like if you're on a plane or something like that, um, the most commonly prescribed sleep medicine is called Ambien. Uh, that is a very effective medicine at getting off to sleep. But I do not recommend it uh, for, for the long haul because uh, it, uh, you get habituated to it. You have to take higher doses over time. There is some addictive potential with the medicine. Uh, and, uh, and over time, it, uh, it disturbs your sleep more than it helps you. In addition to that, particularly in older people, uh, these sedative medicines like Ambien have been shown to increase the risk of falls and hip fracture. Uh, they've actually been shown that uh, for people that have like truckers and people like that that take it the night before, the increase in car accidents. Um, so there are serious medicines and, and uh, you know, can be used for, for a short period of time, but really should not be used for a long period of time. So these are the things that you can do uh, tonight if you, want, if you suffer from insomnia and you want to try to, uh, to overcome it. First, uh, go to bed when you're sleepy um, and arise at the same time uh, every morning. Uh, try not to take naps uh, throughout the day unless you are a long distance trucker or shift worker or something like that. <laughs> so if any of you are, are one of those, then naps, the rule about naps doesn't necessarily apply to you. Um, uh, the, uh, then you could try the relaxation techniques when you're getting off to sleep and you could try them as well when you wake up. Uh, and then um, get out of bed when you're sleepy within reason uh, and uh, use the bed for sleep only. Um, I recommend uh, at least a trial of no alcohol or caffeine uh, for a period of time. Uh, having a cool bedroom getting some lights in your eyes in the morning, and getting, uh, uh, getting good exercise throughout the day to help build your sleep drive. Um, if all of that doesn't get you a good night of sleep, uh, then uh, um, you can try a version yourself of this sleep restriction uh, therapy, uh, but um, you may want to work with a doctor on that, uh, d depending on how long you're sleeping. Um, when patients tell me, uh, 
Well, my they even show me on their on their tracking to to show that their average night of sleep is four and a half hours. Um, you know, we have to make some accommodations. Uh, you know, there, there's uh, there's certain uh, lengths in bed that are just too short. You know, so five hours in bed is is not uh, generally what I recommend. So I have some I have some cases, but but uh, but. Um, I'll just uh, run through each slide on the cases very quickly, and then uh, and then I'll take questions. So my first case is a uh, is a uh, college student who goes to bed at midnight, wakes up at six o'clock in the morning, and ta then takes three naps until eleven o'clock, which is uh, probably if it was a college student, it should be two o'clock in the morning that she goes to sleep, and she gets up at two o'clock in the afternoon. But um, my next patient is uh, a patient who is very anxious about her sleep. And she gets into bed at 9 o'clock at night and then tries, tries, tries her hardest to get off to sleep, but she can't get off to sleep. So she ends up not falling asleep until midnight or 10 o'clock, you know, 11 o'clock at night. Uh, so she's hours in bed laying there trying to get to sleep. And she has a terrible night of sleep. And my last patient um, has uh, snores really loudly, wakes up choking. Uh, and sleeps uh, nine to ten hours, and when he wakes up in the morning, he has a headache. So those are my my cases. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Um, I love doing this talk, so I love to take questions now. Thank you for that comprehensive uh, run through. Sure. Goodness. There is one thing I'd like you to just say a few words about, and that yeah. would be food. Uh, oh, yeah. What kind of food, what time, how much, generally for good sleep? Right. So uh, the, the, um, the literature on f diet and sleep uh, suggests that, uh, that diets that are high in carbohydrates, particularly simple carbohydrates, can disturb your sleep. Uh, and so the general recommendation is that if you if you are going to have some dessert or, or if you're going to eat something sweet, that you try to separate the bedtime uh, from that that sweet that you ate by about two to three hours. Uh, and there's other uh, diets that that uh, suggest. Well, there's other reasons why you know eating uh, you know midnight snacks and things like that is not good for your metabolism and you know good for glycemic control and prediabetes and things like that. So there's other reasons why you might want to separate carbohydrates from uh, from your bedtime. Um, uh, beyond that, um, you have to eat uh, enough food and food that's filling and satisfying enough uh, that you don't feel hungry you know, the minute that you get into bed. So the hunger creates kind of an arousal signal as well. Uh, so um, generally speaking, my, my recommendations are around sweets and uh, carbohydrates, and that's what I recommend. I, I'd like Just to, to build on that a little bit, yeah. know, serotonin, I, most of it's, in, you know, it manufactured it in your gut. Mm -hmm. And so tying into the food aspect and the microbiome, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I think that, that the jury is still out on whether or not uh, there are ways to, cer certainly there are uh, uh, beneficial bacteria, keystone bacteria, uh, that uh, that produce the various neurotransmitters that have been associated with decrease in overall stress. Uh, in, uh, there's uh, various uh, bacteria that are associated with uh, with uh, improvements in depression, um, and you know there's a lot of power I think to uh, to the gut microbiome, but we don't yet quite know how to uh, manipulate it in such a way that we can produce a clinical result. Uh, so uh, there are some good general recommendations to increase the keystone bacteria uh, in your gut, like eating a lot of fiber and prebiotics and you know, doing things that'll improve the beneficial bacteria in the gut, um, but creating a direct link between those things and a good night of sleep has just not been done yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll could you identify the sleep tracking device that you use? Oh, I was going to ask. Oh, oh this one, the, the one that we use is, is called a Aura Ring, O-U-R-A. Um, and uh, uh, they're available online. I think they're about, uh, 
about three hundred dollars. Um, so uh, there are there are a bunch of other uh, sleep trackers that are out there on the market. Um, the reason I like this one is because I find clinically and personally that the the model that it uses for deep sleep and REM sleep is pretty good. Um, I have quite a few patients that will they have Apple watches, they have or a Whoop band which also does sleep, uh, and I get a chance in the office to compare their aura ring data to the other thing that they're wearing. They're doing two kinds of sleep tracking. And I find that um, uh, the aura ring is the best one to correlate with the symptoms and the feeling of a really good night of sleep when I look at the deep and the REM. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, sure. Um, speaking about deep sleeping, yeah. um, where, when you dream yeah. as you sleep, uh, does that mean that you really slept well? Uh, yes, actually, that's a that's a great question, and uh, and you know for for a long time it wasn't clear whether or not uh, dreaming was a good thing or a bad thing. We now know that it's a very good thing, uh, and um, uh, dream sleep is is a state. If you look at the brain waves of someone who's in uh, dream sleep, um, it's very similar, almost identical actually to the brain waves of someone who's awake. But you but you know you probably know that you're you're paralyzed at that point, so you're you're watching a movie that your brain is is sort of producing for you, and we know that the that it's the emotions that you felt uh, during the day that are producing those those dreams at night. So one theory about dream sleep is that um, your your brain is kind of in rehearsal mode, and it's showing you an image that is recreating that emotion, but it's doing it in kind of a safe environment to sort of get you over it or get you sort of used to whatever that emotion that it was that you were having throughout the day. And in, in terms of interruption, when you go to restroom, come back, and you sleep again, yeah. Uh, so, so that would accumulate, right? I mean, it would be... Right. So, so what, that is, that is a, another good question. So, the, so the, the, when you wake up at night, especially if it's, if, if it's to go to the restroom and it's 4 o'clock in the morning and you're really only going to sleep another two hours, um, you probably have the experience that you, uh, you feel like you dreamt a lot for the, for, uh, between 4 a.m. and 6 or 7 a.m. That is because you remembered those dreams. You might have had other dreams you know, throughout the night, but if you didn't wake up at the end of those other dreams, you don't remember them. When you wake up in the middle of a dream cycle, you remember that dream. And we know that the, that the deep sleep is happening more uh, commonly in the first half of the night, the first four hours of your sleep, and the dream sleep is more common in the second uh, half of your sleep when you're about, about to wake up. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, getting that, uh, that full eight hours of sleep and getting the benefits, the creativity benefits, the emotional health benefits of the REM sleep in the second half of your sleep and the physical and the memory benefits of the deep sleep in the first half of your sleep is what really constitutes a full, ideal eight hours of sleep. Sure. Going back to diet, um, I've watched my, what I eat and how I sleep. Yeah. And I find if I have a, a protein, fat, rich dinner, I don't sleep very well. Oh, interesting. If I have a lot of colorful and green leafy vegetables for dinner, yeah, and not maybe some tofu or something that's light protein, I sleep much better. Yeah. And I read recently that that the vegetables have glycine, more glycine than the animal products. Interesting. And that even taking three grams of, or uh, I forget, maybe th three tenths, a small amount of glycine powder helps with sleep, uh, be better than melatonin. Interesting. And I find with melatonin, I can sleep like you say, but it's not a restful sleep. Exactly. Yeah, uh, th those are good comments. I didn't know that about about glycine, but but the uh, um, yeah. So my position on melatonin is that uh, it doesn't work, and and if it and if it uh, if it does work at all, it's not uh, giving you a really good restful night of sleep, and you get habituated to it so that you, maybe that first night you got off to sleep a little faster, but the second night that you take melatonin, it didn't do anything, and maybe just disturb your sleep. Thank you for that comment. CBD good for falling asleep or quality of sleep? So CBD is uh, and uh, this is another question that I get commonly. So um, 
the the there are two components to uh, to marijuana, the the sort of uh, active bioactive or psychoactive components of marijuana. One is THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, and uh, and that is the, uh, the the psychoactive component that makes you feel high, makes you, uh, and it can make you drowsy. Um, and then CBD, which is not psychoactive, uh, anti-inflammatory, may have some, uh, may make you uh, more sleepy in certain circumstances. Um, when CBD by itself, without the THC, has been studied, um, it looks like it does help you get to sleep a little bit. And thus far, no one has ever shown that it disturbs your sleep cycle. So right now, there's not a ton of literature on it, but right now, um, it's you you know most you can't recommend against using uh, CBD. It's it's probably an okay thing to do, uh, and there uh, uh, in the the stores that distribute the CBD there are various types of CBD, uh, and I would just trust them in terms of which uh, which one is more likely to produce uh, some sleep. And and again, I think it's an okay thing to do. Um, I was wondering about these weight loss drugs that everybody yeah. and their brother and sisters seem to be on right <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah. Can you talk, and it's so new uh -huh. out there in the world, and right. everybody seems to be dropping 50 pounds, you know? Right. So is there a connection between, just curious, those yeah. drugs, because I've read both, um, and sleep? Uh, well, well, first off, I have a whole talk that on, on uh, metabolism, and those drugs are a big part of that talk. So... If you invite me back, I would love to talk about that. That's that's <laughs> that's my second favorite talk okay. uh, to to give. Um, and and um, there uh, those drugs have not been shown to uh, to uh, worsen sleep. Okay. Hypoglycemia can make your sleep worse. Yeah. So if you have diabetes and you're taking one of those drugs, because they're di di you know they're medicines for diabetes. Right. Those drugs, mm -hmm. uh, they can be used for weight loss, and you know they might. You know, and we'll talk about this if uh, if I if we do this other talk, um, but they might be pretty effective, you know, uh, drugs for uh, for weight loss, and they might actually have some benefits related to cardiovascular health and other things that are are uh, additional benefits of those drugs that people need to know about, mm -hmm. rather than just thinking of them purely as weight loss drugs. Um, but if you uh, have diabetes and you are on other medicines other than the Ozempic or the the weight loss medicine, uh, and uh, you go on the Ozempic and it's reducing your blood glucose down into the 60s and 70s, that can create a stimulant, you know, an arousal signal, and, and it can definitely um, disturb your sleep. Um, uh, the, but other than that, um, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know of any uh, direct connection between sleep disturbance and those drugs. Okay. And ju just a, another, someone told me, I have a uh, sister who's a, a nurse, and she was telling me that she saw a lot of people who were absolutely hooked on Advil, PM, would take it a long time, and it affects negatively their, their gut, and they would go back to serotonin again. Is that uh, true? Do those kinds of, you mentioned I, I to stay the, away from those. I think those. The, the active, I can't remember what the active ingredient in Advil, PM is. It's, I, think it's, I think it's like diphenhydramine or something like that. I think it's an, like an antihistamine. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so those medicines, similar to, to serotonin, uh, excuse me, similar to melatonin, yeah. um, they work for a short period of time, but then they don't work after that. Yeah. Uh, and and they do disturb sleep. Uh, so they they interfere with sleep architecture. If mm -hmm. if it is diphenhydramine, that's that's the thing that's in Advil PM, mm -hmm. um, or you know some uh, anticholinergic antihistamine medicine like that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but they disturb sleep architecture. You get habituated to them. They don't work over a period of time. Uh, and I don't generally recommend them. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. Thank you. Uh, many of us are traveling, and oh, yeah. air travel is particularly stressful. Yeah. I just had a couple of flights with screaming children and a middle seat and et cetera. Right. Do you have some good tips um, either for getting some sleep on the plane or overcoming the jet lag and the general stress? I had a sore jaw and neck for a day. Yeah, there are some uh, there are some uh, good cell phone apps that you can use. I think the one that I learned about recently is called Rise, R I S E. Um, that that is a circadian rhythm app, and what happens? Uh, we're talking. Are we talking about jet lag? Or are we talking just about the stress of the flight? 
Okay. So, so if, if the disturbance of your circadian rhythm, because you've traveled to a new time zone and now your body wants you to go to sleep, but it's not time to go to sleep yet, uh, is, is an issue, uh, then, um, you know, when you're, when you're going in the direction where you're sleepy before everybody else is going to sleep, which I guess would be traveling west? Yeah, west. Okay. Um, then, uh, then just stay up you know, and usually you'll have, uh, you know, kind of one night where you wake up a little bit early and, you know, you kind of get, get readjusted when you're traveling in that direction. When you travel in the other direction uh, and you're awake when everybody else is going to sleep, that is the one circumstance where taking melatonin might actually be an okay thing to do. So my, my recommendations for jet lag are the the ri using one of these mobile phone apps to time your circadian rhythm perfectly. Uh, number two, um, just keep yourself awake if you're traveling west. If you're traveling east, uh, then, uh, then that is the one circumstance where taking a melatonin to try to get off to sleep might, might actually help. You mentioned exercise, and we all know that's good for us. Yeah. Uh, but what about any particular kinds of exercises, yoga or whatever, in the evenings? Or is there a specific yeah. time to, that might help sleep? Yeah, so separating, separating the exercise, uh, you don't want to create an arousal signal with the exercise. And when you exercise, the neuro, uh, norepinephrine and you know, cortisol, kind of the stress hormones, do actually get released in, in a low level during the exercise. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then sometimes after the exercise, they stay around uh, for up to an hour or two hours after you finish the exercise. So you don't want to do like really vigorous exercise right before you go to sleep. Uh, that's the first thing I'll say. If it's gentle exercise and there's like yoga where you're, where you're doing kind of a lot of mind-body work while you're doing the yoga, that's okay. Mm -hmm. As long as you're kind of chilling out, you know, as you're, as you're doing the exercise. Um, what was the other question you had? So we talked about the timing of the exercise yeah. or the type. Yeah. So the so uh, so if you're trying to build your sleep drive throughout the day, uh, then uh, vigorous cardiovascular exercise is probably the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. So if you do if you run or bike or swim or something like that, and that's your your main cardiovascular exercise, and you do it early enough in the day, that's a good way to build your sleep drive. But the other thing that, that we tell our patients, and the thing I always recommend is, um, we experiment with various things. So that's part of the therapy. Part of the therapy is, let's try this, let's try that, and let's see how it comes out on your sleep tracker. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do a lot of experiments with exercise where we say to people, well, I don't think you're active enough during the day. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's uh, bump up your exercise, and then let's see if that produces a good night of sleep that night. And then we keep notes on all that stuff. Uh, and um, just on a little side note, uh, I, I live in some good-sized hills that I walk up during yeah. the day. And I one time uh, saw this uh, woman who was walking up backwards up this very steep hill. Yeah. And, I, and I started doing it after yeah. that because I thought that was a good idea. But yeah. she did it because it stopped her restless leg. No kidding. She, uh, that's what I said. Wow. Yeah. She's, and I, she said, it's the only thing that stopped my restless leg syndrome so I can sleep at night. Wow. So you've never heard that before? Cool. No, I never uh, heard that. Okay, well. I didn't hear the glycine and I didn't hear the, the walking backwards well, for Russell's leg. Well, she swore so. by it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yep. That's cool. Um, I was in a class at the senior center with UCSF was doing some pre, um, prior studies for the brain and music. Oh, so cool. we were in a um, th couple three month studies. They're going to set up a three year thing and do MRIs before and after. Um, but we were going every week and meeting, and we had homework. So we were listening to a lot of music. Yeah. And then having different, re you know, the 30s, you know, music and then 40s and films and this and that. Okay, so we would get together and I noticed, and there's no science for this, that I was dreaming a lot more. Oh, interesting. And I, another one of my mates said the same thing. And so um, 
we may not be, we want to really be in the three-year study when they figure it out because we were first in one where you do piano, we were in one where it's listening and then other people were doing piano mm -hmm. and then they switched it around and the listening one was much more powerful for mm. me. Interesting. And um, yeah, so anyway, there's no science behind it, but I just was like, there's other people and so I've just said, okay, I don't need to be in a study, I'll just do it. Yeah, I'm listening to a lot more music. Cool, good. That's, do you enjoy it? Oh, <laughs> I'm into jazz. Uh, You're into jazz. Yeah. Jazz yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting. I mean, uh, you know, I think I think um, uh, anything that can uh, make you feel more relaxed and decrease that arousal signal at you know just the right time, so that you're you're timing your body clock and your sleep drive is high, and you get that great night of sleep. Um, is a is a good idea. So uh, you know, presumably, as long as it's not really sort of activating music, you know, that's like dubstep or something like that. <laughs> you know, then <laughs> you uh, I I presume that the that 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 would really kind of chill you out and make you feel like you're you know listening to Bach or something like that. Okay, well, that was just wonderful. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So our thanks to Dr. Eric Pfeiffer for his comments here today. We also thank our audiences here and watching on YouTube um, online. And now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California commemorating its 120th year of enlightened discussion is adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.